The International Sewing Arts Festival is proud to announce that our first-ever class catalog is now available for viewing online. It features classes from some of the most sought-after instructors in the sewing world. ISAF has projects for everyone. Don't forget to check out one of our fantastic runway shows featuring the gowns from Season 30 of Dancing with the Stars or the best of Angela Wolf. Don't delay. Sign up today. And we will see you January 13th through the 15th, 2022, in Ontario, California, for our debut event. Visit our website, www.sewingfestival.com, for more information about this exciting event. Hi, and welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Sarah McFarland, Editorial Director, and I'm joined by our Senior Technical Editor, Carol Frazier. Hi, folks. And our special guest this episode is Diane Erickson. Hi, thanks for having me. You're very welcome, Diane. We're excited to talk to you. A seasoned artist and designer, Diane has been sharing ideas and design techniques as a contributor to the sewing industry through workshops and magazine articles over the years. Her focus is always on how you can expand your creative process as you build the design skills to express a more personal style. She's based in Ashland, Oregon, and she teaches workshops and offers design outside the lines retreats nationally. Diane blogs at dianeerickson.com. That's also where you can sign up for her e-letter. And you can find her on Instagram at Diane Erickson. Well, welcome to the podcast, Diane. Uh, we're going to start off with the five questions that we ask every new guest. Okay. So how did you learn to sew? Um, I have a background, a Scandinavian background. And I remember watching my grandmother and her sister um, doing all the Swedish Scandinavian needle arts and sitting and embroidering and and huck toweling and doing all of that kind of work and they weren't garment sewers or fabric sewers but my mother was a sewer and um very much influenced me um over time and uh really enjoyed watching her enthusiasm for sewing this is a bit of a side question but i'm curious when did you make your first garment um, you know, I think I was in junior high and I was a late bloomer. My sisters were making coats in the sixth grade. I was a late bloomer and I was the one who would go to the thrift store and buy two or three house dresses, cut them up, put them back together and make something that I felt was more me, which is kind of what I do now. So I think it kind of comes full circle. What are you currently sewing? Currently, I am remaking my wardrobe, creating a wardrobe from scratch, which, um, as you know, uh, that's an amazing opportunity that most of us don't don't get. And um, after losing my all my belongings in the fire a year ago, um, I have been rebuilding my wardrobe, which was all handmade and really thinking about um, what do I really want to wear? which is different than, oh, I could make all this cool stuff, but what do I really want to wear? What do I want to live in? What feels like me right now? So that's been a really amazing process. And I know when we get into the the main episode for this podcast, we're going to be able to talk more about that project and uh, a little bit more uh, what you want to share about what you went through. It's a very compelling story. Which fabric do you enjoy sewing the most? I am a linen, 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 linen girl all the way. I just, I have natural fabrics for sure, but I'm, for some reason, I like the weight, the drape, the possibility of linen, all different kinds of linen. And I like the story of what linen is. So that is my, that is my go-to um, all seasons. Uh, and then I would layer it up with other things for more warmth or lighter layers in the summertime. Which sewing word or term is your favorite? Ease, <laughs> you know, easing something in, ease of ease of construction, ease of things flowing together. When you said that, my first thing was, it's got to be ease. And could you share what you love best about sewing? I love community. And I love that sewing is teaches you about problem solving for one, but sewing is also really so much about 
um, creating a network of people around you who have a common interest and um, a common story. And textile is so emotional and palpable and connects people in a way that other materials don't. So I love that about it. Oh, that's so true. Diane, thank you for answering the five questions. You're welcome. One of the first things uh, that I noticed when I visited your website was, of course, your wardrobe project. And mm -hmm. you want to talk a little more in depth about that? Um, that has been a overwhelming and daunting in the beginning. And as we sit here, last week was the one year anniversary of um, the transformation that the fire caused in my life. And it has taken, it, it, it's taken a long time to just kind of settle into where am I now? And I realize sewing a wardrobe that feels personal is so different than making what's popular at the time. Sewing a wardrobe is acknowledging who you are, what your life is about, what your style is, and it's so much more than what makes your hips look small, your skin look good. It's so much more than that. It's much more about what do you need to be comfortable in the world? What do you need to show up in a way that feels like who you really are? So those are the kinds of things I've been sitting with this year. It starts with, oh, that feel, that's a really nice fabric. I love the feel of that. I want to use that. And I was gifted um, after the fire, people in our community sent me amazing collections of tools and materials and trims and all kinds of things, which was so moving and emotional. And so I sit with these things that a lot of these people who know me say, I think Diane would like this because this is the kind of stuff she would use. And so I have a lot of those things that have kind of crossed over from you and other people who said, here, here, so with this. So for me, that connection to community has been really powerful. And I've really stayed with, especially as a longtime teacher, it's so easy to get caught up in what cool thing do I need to make? And I know I can make anything I can think of. But then the second piece that settles into me is, yeah, you could make those four things, but what do you really need to make for you? And that is what I've been staying with, with the, the project of creating a wardrobe from scratch. And um, before the end of the year now, I need to, to upload many more things. And, and I'm going to show like a big timeline of all these different things I've made. I keep making things and then not posting them. It's like, I, I can't be the only one who would be slow at that. But um, that has been a really moving piece for me. Diane, I don't, don't think you've ever made anything that wasn't cool in some way. So you. you can just keep on making and everything will turn out cool. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering about the fabrics that you use because you, I mean, even what you have on today is made up of a bunch of different types of fabric. And I know that's a style you've had for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when you lose all of that from your studio, you know, everything that already has a sentimental attachment I was really wondering how you how you start back up again. And it sounds like people really fed you what you needed to to do that. Yeah, and it you know, it really harkened back to the place where we all say this at some point, I think. It's like we think we need something else outside of ourselves or something better or a more interesting piece of fabric. But what's true is, and I keep reminding myself, you always have what you need. That has been a much more Zen collection this year. But to remind myself, no, you have what you need inside and outside. It's here. You just need to make sense of it. And I have always felt like, you know, one of my strong suits is that ability to uh, be sensitive to collection and connection and juxtaposition of things. And I'm, I love that pop of saying, no, this does go with this. I want to make these two things speak to one another. And that partially drives my need to remake. So, I, you know, in, in the garment, the garment I'm wearing, which I think you have a photo of, is, is a birthday garment. And it's a combination of a piece of fabric that a friend printed, um, recycle, a recycled garment that I cut up, and I think probably a small bit of home deck stuff. And, you know, the buttons are odd pieces of 
aluminum that are tied on with elastic and it's 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 lined it's beautifully made but it's not stuff that we might always spend that kind of time on but for me what makes something valuable is what you do with that thing it's not what what it started out as it's what you as a maker bring to that experience so i'm always attracted to what's that odd thing that i can make speak to these other things because i know i can make beauty and that has been a really pivotal theme throughout my year is i need beauty i need to see it i need to make it and um sewing can be very emotional that way you know it's a reflection of us if we really allow it to be and I have reflected back to myself and all the things I've been making this year um a piece of my next story and what I want to be about and and a deep appreciation for where I've come and what my life experiences have been. Now, Diane, I uh Carol and I know your story and many people in the sewing community do as well. But for anyone who's listening who doesn't know about the fire, uh, could you share a few details of that? Where were you living before? The fire was um August, I mean, excuse me, September 8th, uh 2020, um a year ago this week. And um it started in Ashland, Oregon where I live and took out the next two towns before Medford, Oregon, called the Almeida Fire, and it was extraordinary, unusual circumstances, and within 10 minutes of it starting, it got to the 70 home community where I lived and took it all out. And literally there was no warning, no nothing, and the neighbor banged on my door. I had 5 minutes to go. and in the middle of finishing a pattern all the illustrations the garments were sitting there i looked up and my life transformed nothing looked important enough to grab glasses you know grabbed a computer some pictures and was able to drive away when people behind me were not able to drive away and had to turn around and run physically run so it it was a moving extraordinary experience the fire continued all day it took out three towns 4700 homes and structures most of the main streets of the next two small towns and 2500 people lost i mean 4700 people lost their places to live in 2500 structures so it was a it was an extraordinary moment of and that reminder that the most amazing breathtaking experiences in life will never be things we can choose or control But what I do know is that we get to control what we do with those things. That's all we have to make choices about. And I am determined to benefit and move forward and and be a fuller human um because of the experience. And my sewing and my making has come in around me because it's so therapeutic. And I've always kind of thought about it that way. but a lot of times i don't think we think about we just know we need to be in our rooms for a while and don't bother me <laughs> um and we need to fondle fabric you know the minute we fondle fabric and we can fondle fabric with a few other people we're we're good to go and and i know that textile crosses over generational economics um style ethnicity and it creates community and we're all one when we all grab that piece of textile and i think that's a powerful piece of what we're about what threads is about and what sharing textile in the bigger um universe is about really yes that's so true uh i was looking at your wardrobe creation and i believe someone sent you a beautiful uh white tunic yes and you've been working on designing more tunics you know sort of based on ideas there i have i have and You know, so I look at everything like it's new information. It's like, "Oh my gosh, I you, you know, I I don't know. It it's kind of like when you look in your refrigerator and you know you need to make something with whatever is there. And this is where your creativity becomes a bigger piece of the conversation. You might be a very traditional technical sewer, but in moments where you're dropped into a new situation, you know you can swim. even though maybe that's not your choice and i think sewers have a lot 
that they can draw from that oftentimes without a little bit of prodding or an unusual opportunity, they don't really pull for those things or reach for those things. And I know that it has given my life so much more meaning and it's always sort of been what I've been drawn to, especially over other big life experiences. I realize how much it means to me to be a maker. Now, Diane, I know that you're very creative with the media you experiment with. And I think you mentioned that you've been doing some things with wood lately that relate to your fabric and sewing work too. Yeah, well, and this is something I've always done off and on. I think makers are looking for problem solving experiences. We are big time problem solvers. That is what we are doing. You combine your skill as a problem solver with your creative skill, and it's a win-win combination. Um, technical isn't always first. It's like we focus on getting good at technical. And what I always say to people in workshops is, great, you can make an awesome bound buttonhole, but now what? Now what? What can you do with the fact that you know that? that will not just be 10 more bound buttonholes the same way. What if you spent a day making nothing but concepts based on bound buttonholes? What if you made them really big, really small? What if it was big and it was a neck hole? What if it was big and it was, what if it was a different shape? What if it was somewhere else? What if it wasn't a buttonhole? You know, so all of those things that make you think differently about materials. So for me, I know in my background, my art background, I was always drawn to basketry and weaving and ceramics and metal and wood and my whole family's builders. And I have built a house the first time I was married. And so having those experiences and being around people who are makers make me realize all of that ability to make all kind of drains into the same place. So the way you problem solve when you have other materials that you problem solve is even more dynamic and awesome and more potential than we would have if we just learned one thing. So for me this year, I found myself needing something way more, way more structural than just the soft, delicate aspects of textile. So I reached back for wood and I found myself making with wood. I needed to reach back to my burn site, which sat that way for five, six months. I would keep going back there feeling like I need to go there, but there's nothing there. I grabbed pieces of wood and I made, I made, the, I made a ladder with wood from my burn site and the minute I brought that ladder, which you, you have an image of, I brought my ladder back and I stood it up in my home and I draped my fabric over it. it. It made me cry. It was emotional because I felt like, okay, I am, I am getting there. I, and, and wood is so much more grounding. So I had been making chairs when the fire happened. I love working with tools. I couldn't even, I didn't have time to grab a chair. And so if you're interested in those stories about making those other things, those started happening in October through the first of the year. So there are blogs on those things if you're interested in more. But I found the, the power of making where something was really working me and I had to feel it and bend it and move it. And it was so much more work and physical. Um, I needed that because I realized I needed to build structure again. Everything in my life that was structural had been pulled up and was gone. Um, my workshops, my studio, everything I owned, um, you know, my husband dying, everything was gone. And so that transformation of creating structure and familiar again really drew me back to wood in a really amazing way. You know, and as I think, as I think about this, um, that has it has cycled through my life in other ways at, at other moments. And the meaning of those things where we can connect them to fabric is, um, and connect more materials that maybe seem um, unlikely for us, I think have really powerful benefit. You know, a, a story related to that and something that people can probably um, appreciate and relate to is, you know, I've also, you know, love weaving and all kinds of other other methods. And when I had a loom, I had a tapestry loom that my dad had been making tapestry looms. I had one of his looms. And when he died a while back in my life, 
I spent the winter warping up that loom and sitting in front of my window all winter and weaving a small rug and thinking about my dad as I sat and wove every day. I'd come over, I'd wind yarns, I'd think about my life and my past and how important that person was. And sometimes that connection between a technique, a material, and really is the memorial or the experience that really brings it together in a way more powerful way. And it just felt like the right thing to do. And what I know is there is no map for these things. You just have to say, I think I, I need to do this. And it was one of the most meaningful winters I have spent. And then the fire took the loom. So I have that, I have pictures, I have the memory of that, and I sat and I'm so glad I made that piece on the loom. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that uh, when you have things, it's the memory of having the thing or making the thing. And I love, I love that aspect of making things for other people too, and yes. thinking about them while you're making that for them. Well, and you know, when pe people have asked me this year, what, what would you have grabbed if you thought about it in the moment? And you know, what's really true is the stuff that has the most importance that I am sad about are things people have touched. My hand embroidered Swedish costume from my childhood that my grandmother embroidered for me. Things that my mother had made, my mom's button collection, her artwork, but things that people had physically made and touched, those had more meaning. So as makers, oh my gosh, that's like a huge celebration to just look around you and remember all the cool things that people have made and shared with you, because those are the things that are going to stay with you, whether you physically have those things or not. Now, Diane, every year, I'm not sure how long, I wanted to ask you about this. You've been making uh, birthday garments or birthday shirts for some time. And the one you're wearing now, is this a, is this a new one? It, well, this was the birthday shirt for last year, and it actually has it has a ladder. We'll share a picture of it. You could send us a, a picture. picture. Yeah. It has a ladder back there. And I did a blog on this around my birthday in February, so there's other little bits about the story. But that has, that has been something I've done off and on for a really long time. And it's like, you know, birth, my birthday comes around, I think about, okay, stop what you're doing. Where are you? What's important? What do you want to celebrate? What do you want to use to pull yourself up? What, what would you be wearing right now? What's your birthday garment this year? And I have done that off and on for years. And then I label, put a label in the back. I date them. I really want to encourage anyone who's listening to this. Think about this as an access to your creativity in a different way and the meaning of your life in a different way. Because I had been making every year a birthday garment and I could look back at those and they were part of my story. They were part of, oh yeah, I remember that's who I was then because they were all symbolic in some way. They all used something, whether it was a metaphor or a physical piece of something. They were all things that spoke to me that I could hold on to that were reminding me of who I, who I am in my life and where I, where I've come. And I, I love that. I love that giving myself permission to stop whatever I'm doing for other people, whatever I'm doing as a teacher, as an, as an example, I need to do for me first, or I have nothing to share. And, you know, women need to be reminded of that. We all, you know, kind of get, get sidetracked, but making birthday garments has been a particularly awesome way to channel um, textile love. Yes, I remember the the former Vogue Patterns magazine had a wonderful article one year about your birthday shirt, and mm -hmm. I think that one incorporated a plane. You yes. had some traveling, yeah. The airplane shirt, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and sometimes they can be about where you wish you were brave enough to be, or and not just where you are and what you're holding, but. And sometimes I write on the inside for myself. I put notes in there. It's like yeah, things that I need to remember and not lose sight of. And that airplane shirt was, you know, had that. There were shirts in the past that have had sheer layers where I could be more revealing of who I actually was. Uh, let people see pieces of myself that I didn't feel I was letting people see. 
And I felt that a lot in my 40s, that I was like, eh, you're kind of in there, but you're sort of hiding out. Do you want to let more of that show? So my clothing became a reminder to myself of what I always had and what I always had the potential to share. Do you think, do you think that level of self-reflection is essential to being creatively successful? I think it's essential for being authentic. I think uh, creativity can live in so many different ways in us. And the more we are true to who we are, it's a bigger gift to the people around us that we're in community with because they get permission to be themselves. And it would be pretty boring if we all just look like what the fashion magazine said we should look like this year. It, it wouldn't be, there's something personal, very personal that gets lost. And as the world gets more complicated, we need, we need things that are more personal. We need people to stand up in their most powerful place and their most potential. And there are things we can do as makers to support that in ourselves. So I think our creativity, when it comes from a place of being real and not just a cool thing we could make, um, it changes the meaning of it for us first and for people around us as well. I do think that people will feel that. I, I think about it when I watch some of the, you know, design programs on TV, Project Runway, and the things that sort of have come from that. Yes. And you can tell when somebody is really authentically in that design process, mm -hmm. because what they make, maybe not to your taste, it might be, but it's always more compelling. Absolutely. And it, it may not look commercial, yeah. But it's still the sort of thing that I'm always more attracted to. Yeah. And it and it taps into your deep, deeper aquifer of story and information. And I found it's been incredibly grounding for me in big life moments where I have needed to reach for that and find some way to be more grounded. And it's oftentimes, you know, it's just something that you have to trust in yourself. There isn't much of a map for the big life moments but it's a place where you just need to say, okay, I'm here and I can get there. And what do I need in order to do that? And you just need to step out one foot in front of the other. You know, Diane, I have never been to one of your design outside the lines workshops, but a few authors I've worked with have, and they come from them and they, they talk like it's a, not a cult exactly, maybe a little bit of a religious experience. And they say, you know, quietly to me, well, I went to Diane Erickson's Design Outside the Lines and I've got this new direction I'm going in and I think I have something to share. And then they propose an article and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you really see how much of a difference it makes to them to be given that guidance to follow whatever is their pathway or, or walk away from what they thought their path was and start something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, have, um, I have been teaching retreats and workshops starting out with my mom when I was since my twenties. And so it's a huge history of that kind of work and seeing people over time. And I know what makes a huge difference for me is this is never just about making something. It's always about growing who you are and your work. And I think what makes it palpable and grounded and meaningful for me is that I know I genuinely want as much for each person in the room as I want for myself. And it isn't just, it, it's deeper. It's deeper and there's a potential. And everyone's ready at a different time. Um, I know I don't, go to, I don't go to workshops. I think, oh, I'd love to do that. And then I think, I spend a lot of time in workshops. I just kind of need to work on things myself. But I know that when people come, everyone is in a different place. And sewing and clothing is so vulnerable because we're looking at, you know, what shape your body is and you're touching people in their clothes and you're helping them pin fit and you're acknowledging what they look like and what's the cool thing they want to do. And that people feel seen in workshops, I think. And people feel a little bit of relax and let down in workshops. And um, I want the experience, I want the situation to be welcoming. I want it to be a combination of new people, people who are new sewers, people who have sewn for 50 years. It's about growing your work. My, 
that's what a, that's what a workshop is at its best. I think it's about growing your work and growing who you are as a maker. And so that can happen in a lot of different ways. And honestly, there are people who show up at retreats and admit to me, they go, you know, I did pack a cutout jacket thinking, well, if nothing else works out, at least I can make the jacket and feel like I got my money's worth. Well, most people say, you know, I never took it out of the box and I had the best time. And I feel like I have so many more things to do now than I ever even thought about before. So that kind of response lets me know it's working. And it's a reminder to me to be moving forward in my path and sharing from that place so that I am open to creating the space that it takes for that workshop to be meaningful for everyone who steps into the room. Diane, I had a follow-up question about your teaching and it's how does your work as a pattern designer influence Mm -hmm. how you teach and what you teach? You know, I love that teaching is such a, teaching and patterns and and design can can overlap in so many phenomenal ways. And for me, the patterns and the stencil designs have all been a way of overlapping my drawing technical um, graphic skills with my love of two-dimensional sewing turns into a three-dimensional thing that moves on a body. And how does that happen? And what happens with grain and, 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 the weight of the fabric and the drape and the where the stitching line would be and how the fit would happen. And all of that is challenges my creativity in ways that other materials don't. And I feel like I have continued to do patterns over the years because the process of sewing and making um, is deepened and challenged in me in ways because I understand pattern making and what a shape would do and how to use a shape in a different way. And so being able to draw those things, being able to draw what's happening as that thing flips over, is eased in, is folded, is um, all of being able to draw those things to me is an additional challenge and something that I know how to do. So I appreciate and bring my other technical skills to the pattern making. And I also I don't like to do the same thing the same way. So like in, in the Pacific purse pattern, there are three different ways to line and turn a purse. And I, and I underline and bold things sometimes because I go, people are not going to, they're not going to think it goes like this, but it does. So it's like, just trust me and do it this way. You'll be amazed. It's really fun. So being able to design and figure out different ways that construction can happen is also what's really fun for me. So it continues to be a platform playground arena that um, lets me use a lot of my skills and um, think about beauty and silhouette and comfort and movement. And like I say, that that process of designing something on a two dimensional surface that becomes a three dimensional moving form is pretty incredible, really. It's like an amazing thing that humans can do this. I, I, I really like that part of it. There's a lot of it that's slightly tedious, but there are parts that keep pulling me back. You mentioned linen is one of your favorite fabrics. Uh, Do you have any other fabrics you've been working with lately? And are you working with any new methods or favorite methods right now? Well, right now I am in the process of, you know, switching into fall winter things and I'm working on some coats. I lost beautiful coats that I had made. And I don't feel like I want to reproduce necessarily something. I look at a picture and I go, oh, that was, I loved that one. And then I think I want what that one felt like on me. I liked pieces of that and I want the next iteration of that. I want it to feel like that. I want it to play when I wrap it around me like that. I want it to feel like a cloud like that. So Those things are the things that I start with. So right now I'm working on several coats. I got a beautiful piece of cashmere from my sweet friend, Marcy Tilton. And she gave me a gorgeous piece of cashmere to make a new coat. So I'm in the process of making a coat. And just to 
expand the process with myself, I connected up with my dear friend, Donna Zimmerman, who started the Webster's, fabulous Webster's Art to Wear yarn shop here in Ashland. And I said, Donna, could you, would you do this with me? Would you knit me some cool pieces? I'm not a knitter. So we have now connected up and we've had the best time. She said, I love doing this with you because she's teaching me about knitting, which is something I have not been attracted to doing. And she's knitting me samples. She's going, it could be like this. It could be like this. I go, well, I want a piece that sort of does this. Could it be like this? So she's knitting swatches. We went to the yarn store together. She's teaching me about this. And all of these things she knows are coming together with all of these things I know. And she's going to give me this bundle of odd pieces that I've asked for. Some roll, some don't, some flatten, some, you know. And I'm going to make this coat. And I'm so excited partially about how meaningful this time with her has been because I'm not in my space alone. And I think this is one of the things as sewers that's worth looking for is how do we create community in a different way? How do we connect with other people? Because mostly we work alone in our spaces. So this one-on-one -on -one of making for someone who doesn't sew or connecting with someone who does something very different, I'm going to make something for Donna. She's making something for me. We're going to have this story come together because she has awesome lifetime skills in this other technical thing that I have not developed. So I get to celebrate that. She gets to share that and figure out how to speak my language. And I'm figuring out how to speak some of her language and it has created so much more meaning for us. So I'm, I'm moving into, I'm moving into winter things. I love natural, you know, I love wool, um, and I'm, I love that. I love the shaping that happens. I, I think ironing is a high art. I spend a lot of time steaming and shaping. And I love what happens when you can mold fabric into a different shape and stitch it heavily with a cool hand stitch and build structure, even if you don't have a structured tailored interior to a particular garment. That structure can be created on the outside with all kinds of different methods. So I'm thinking back into those things and excited to make winter garments and staying with the feeling I want them to have. So there'll be coats and some silk scarves, some architectural looking interesting scarves that are a way of celebrating. Yeah, you started here, but now you've raised the bar and you're on a new platform. And it's, you know, big life moments are breathtaking and transforming. And I, I want to grow in really awesome ways from that. And otherwise, it's, it's just too difficult to go through those things and to feel the loss and the grief and all of those things that we just think, well, if we could only avoid that, but clearly we can't. And I think the power of making allows us to make our way through really difficult experiences. And I'm appreciating that more now than ever. Well, Diane, we are actually at the end of our time. It's been so wonderful to talk with you. You're very enlightening, inspiring, and you have such a positive outlook. And it's going to be a while, but we're going to see uh, some of your work in threads. I'm, I'm sure we're, we're talking stories, but you know, we work many months in advance. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And um, thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoyed connecting with your viewers again. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads. Threads.